You're listening to The Western Rookie, a hunting podcast full of tips, tricks, and strategies from seasoned Western hunters. There are plenty of opportunities out there. We just need to learn how to take on the challenges. Hunting is completely different up there. I've harvested 26 big game animals. You can fool their eyes, but you can't fool their nose. The 300 yards back to the road turned into three miles back the other way. It's always cool seeing new hunters go and harvest an animal. I don't know what to expect. If there's anybody I want in the woods with me, it'll be you. Welcome back to another Western Rookie Podcast episode. I'm your host, Brian Krebs, and today I have Rusty Smith on the call. Rusty just got back from a Canadian whitetail hunt. Maybe we should, maybe, I said we should start with caribou, but maybe we should start with Canadian whitetail, because I don't think we've ever had that topic on the podcast. Oh, right on. Yeah, so, fun. I've done it twice, uh, last year and this year, and I don't know if you know anything about Canadian whitetails. Those suckers are huge, and I, I don't just mean antlers. I mean body size and and everything. They, they grow some big, big animals up there. Yeah, so, I, you know, we're in northern Minnesota. Well, not northern Minnesota. We're in the northern United States, but in Minnesota, and we have like full body whitetails i just call them full body whitetails sure. they're not small they're not texas alabama whitetails you know but i think the biggest i've personally seen was 227 field dressed which is a Jeez. big it's a big animal yeah but i've heard like rumors of like giant old bucks in canada just blow that out of the water yeah the the area i was hunting is pretty far north in alberta and uh it's not unusual for them to kill 350 pound bucks. Still not not dressed, yeah. But 350, and a few years ago they killed one that went 400. Oh my gosh! Are you like way up by the northern territories? Uh, we're not quite that far north. When you go into Alberta, you got a lot of your uh, rolling farmland. Looks more like Nebraska, Kansas type stuff down low. And then when you get up, oh, several hours north of like Edmonton, you start to hit pine forests. Mm. And those pines, especially like if you look on a map, you'll just see it go green all of a sudden. And it goes green all the way up to the Northwest Territories and beyond. And I go up and hunt right on that edge, right where your farmland yeah. and everything meets the pines. Where there's food and cover. Yep, exactly. So you're a, obviously, we talked about it before we started, you're an Idaho resident, American. Yeah. So you're, do you either, do you know people in Canada or are you just going with an outfitter? Because Canada's got like similar to Alaska rules. I think they're probably even more strict than Alaska where it's like big game is a no go unless you know someone or you are guided. Yeah, it's tricky. Uh, Canada, I, I go up with an outfitter who is a friend. Okay. Um, I consider him a really, really good friend. And uh, because you're correct, if you're going to Canada from the States, you have to have an outfitter or they can do like what's called a hosted hunt. Yeah. Um, where you got to have a buddy or family member there that's, hey, you're coming with me. You're with me the whole time yeah, right. uh, type scenario. So uh, outside of that, you you got to go with some sort of a, an outfitter. It's not Alberta Darkhorn, is it? No, but I know those guys. Okay. They are, yeah. yeah. Cause I was, you said Alberta Monster <laughs> Bucks and I was like, well. They have monster bucks and they're in Alberta and I've, I haven't, I haven't had them on the podcast or anything. I've just found them on Instagram and, you know, every now and then when I need some inspiration to not shoot a little buck page. and call my <laughs> yeah, season over, I go to their page. So they're, they're up in that same world. They're, they're in the same general world where the plains meet the, the pines is where I go. Like they, they hunt really close to where I'm at. Yeah, my father-in-law does a Manitoba deer hunt every now and then with his buddies, and it sounds similar. He, um, I mean, he's a pretty avid deer hunter, and yeah. when he goes up there, he's like, it is insane. Like, it's cold, you sit all day, I mean, it's hard hunting, but the number of deer you see and, like, the number of good bucks you see is unlike anything he's ever experienced in Minnesota. He said it just... It is. You'll see it's, dozens and dozens of deer. Maybe some nights he said we've seen like a dozen bucks, like a dozen bucks. You have to like check every one of them with the glass to see if it's a shooter because they're all. Yeah, good. It's a crazy world. My, my buddy, um, he's really well known in the whitetail world. Uh, Clay Charlton, um, take them outfitters is who he is. If you look him up, you'll, you'll have the same kind of inspiration you were seeing on the, yeah. the dark horn page. But, uh, it is interesting. If you're out in kind of that farmland, it meets the timber area, you see a ton of deer. 
but then you can get farther up into that bush where you don't see as many, but it's so thick. I mean, you're taking shots that aren't farther than 70 yards and some of them less, but there's deer up in that, that bush that have like never seen people. That's um, crazy. And Alberta doesn't have baiting. Saskatchewan, they can bait. Alberta doesn't. So they get way more bucks to maturity out in that bush. And they are literally world-class sized animals up there. They're not easy to hunt. No, um, I bet not. Especially if you get out in that bush, but man, you, you know, you're on some monsters. How did you meet your buddy? Did you just find the place and went, and then you just, you know, met him through going to his outfit and now you're friends or did you, were you friends with him first? And then he said, you know, you need, you got, you got to come up here, man. You die out hunter, come up. Yeah. Great question. So interesting world. It started with, um, I'll back up even a little farther. I never hunted a whitetail in my life until 2015. So in Southeast Idaho, where I live, we don't, we don't have whitetails. If I want to have whitetail in Idaho, I got to go to Northern Idaho. There's a few little pockets yeah. in central Idaho that have them, but you know, you got to go up towards the panhandle, Coeur d'Alene, et cetera. And uh, so I grew up hunting deer, elk. I grew up in a houndsman family. We ran cats and never saw them. And so it wasn't until 2015 I uh, shot my first whitetail. I think I've killed like eight or nine cents going to different states um, in the Midwest, in Idaho. And I just started getting a hankering for these big Canadian bucks, just like you saw on that Instagram page. Yeah. I'm drooling over these dark antlered. Instead, you know, I'm in the Midwest hunting these things that are just these bright white antlers. It's easier to see the bucks than the does because they stand out. And uh, I got a hankering for these big Canadian bucks. So I started searching. I was looking on the internet. I was looking on Instagram, um, looked at the Alberta Dark Horror guys page the same. And I found Clay's Take Em Outfitters. And I started looking at some of the stuff this guy was taking. And I got looking into him. And Clay's a world-class hunter. I mean, elk, deer, moose, he's done it. He runs trap lines. He does giant waterfowl hunts. Uh, you, you name it, he is like the classic Northern Canadian outdoorsman. Um, and I reached out to him. So I, my, I just reached out to him and started talking to him about his hunts and what was his options, what was available, blah, blah, blah. And it started out as that, a relationship from us just talking on social media of all okay. things. Um, went up and hunted with him uh, and I'm not a, I'm not an outfitter guy. I, I'm a DIY guy. It's, it's the first hunt I've ever done that I've like paid to go with an outfitter. Right. Um, this guy is awesome. They treat you like, I literally feel like I'm family at their place. Um, super good people. And this guy is a white tail whisperer. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, I thought I've started to learn a lot about whitetails over the last, you know, eight years or so. And, and this guy's taught me so much more in just a couple of times I've gone up with him. We've become good friends. We, we get on phone calls. We share text messages of our different hunts throughout the year, all kinds of stuff. Um, and, you know, so if I got to go to Canada and I got to have an outfitter because the way the rules are set up, I'm going with my buddy Clay. Yeah. So now is it to the point where you would like to do that every year? Is like as long as the calendar works out, I'm going to Canada and shooting a white tail with my buddy. Yeah, because it's it's tricky. I've often wanted to go to. I mean, I've often hunted Colorado third season, which is November, right? Yeah. Um, and so you could have some conflicts, but like last year, I I had a third season Colorado tag, and I ended up booking this Canada hunt. And it literally turned out I was going to have two days to hunt Colorado third season. And then I needed to be driving to Canada. Um, so I did. I, I went down early to Colorado. I actually ended up shooting a mule deer with my bow during the rifle season um, and then busted to Canada. And after doing that, it's like I would totally give up my Colorado mule deer hunting to go up and hunt those Canadian whitetails every year if I can make it happen. Yeah, I'm a DIY guy as well. Um, I've never been on a big game outfitted hunt. I've never been on any outfitted hunt. I've had the closest thing I've had to outfitters are buddies that are so good and have such good gear. They yeah. should be charging their buddies to come with them. Sure. I mean, I've had some waterfall hunts where guys have had 100 dozen flocked head snow, 750 conkers, 10 layout blinds, three, I mean, just everything. 
He yeah. had three hedge trimmers in his trailer, and he'd be like, "You three go out and trim hide. Like, go find weeds and trim them with these ha- like steel hedge trimmers. They're not pulling stuff out of the ground with your hands. You three go brush in the. You know, you three put out all the decoy. Like he's just, like running a production line out here, and so that's the closest thing. I mean, it's basically outfitted at that sure. point. I brought the snacks and the comic relief and <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and a lot of shells because I'm not a very good shot at waterfall. It's perfect." Um, but I have to imagine, and I'm really curious to hear your perspective on this, because as a DIY guy, I've done DIY elk. We've packed them out the whole nine yards. I think I've done every animal in the West other than like the Kings game, right? Uh-huh. Like anything that takes you a lifetime to draw. Haven't sure. done, haven't done sheep, goats, you know, moose, the big, the big three. Um, but the rest of it we've done and we've always done as a family DIY. My brother's done a couple early D or outfitted hunts back in his elk hunting career, but now it's all DIY. Sure. Is it nice after a season of grinding to just show up to a place and things just work? Yeah. Um, I, I don't have a lot to refer to other than going up with my buddy clay, but yeah, I, for example, this year I grinded all fall. I had a caribou hunt in August. I had a, uh, archery antelope, hunt in August. Um, I killed two bull elk with my bow this fall in September. Um, just grinding away and Clay's up there doing the real work. Like he's scouting for these bucks. He's finding scrape lines and, you know, putting out some trail cameras and finding where these guys live, where their bedrooms are and doing all that work, putting stands out, etc. And it is nice. I show up and, and, uh, Clay, what are you seeing? Oh, can't believe what I'm seeing, you know? And, and showing me what he's finding and I'm using his expertise. I mean, he's, he's the one that's the real hunter in this hunt. And then he's putting his faith in me that he can put me in a stand and I can take care of one of those big bucks for him. You know, um, right. it is, it is nice. Uh, I love the grind. I love the personal satisfaction that comes from the grind, but uh, it is nice to show up and he's, they're feeding me every night. And <laughs> <laughs> that's that's some of what, what i mean too because you know you know i do shed hunting i'll sleep in the back of my i sleep in the bed of my pickup yeah. at 15 below for like these early shed hunts in in north yeah. dakota where it's cold and it's like it's so cold you don't even want to cook food because you don't want to go outside you're like what yeah. kind of snacks do i have in here and um you know elk hunting setting up tents early mornings in just chores like you always got to do your own chores and get ready to hunt and all like I got to imagine it's nice when you just put your bag and your gun or bow in the truck and you show up and you know you're sleeping in a warm bed each night and you're taking mm-hmm. like good meals and everyone likes to you know take the like I feel like it's like no longer cool if it's not incredibly hard right you know like it's not cool unless it's a grind and it's like uncomfortable and miserable and just like you're a hardened person for doing it and I'm like, I don't know. I would love to just go out and be like, dude, you need to sit in the stand. And I sit in the stand and I see 200 deer. I'd be like, I'd love that. I'd, I'm not going to skip the other stuff, but by the sure. end of November, I'm ready to sit in a blind with a heater. A hundred percent. And I, I get plenty of grinding with all the hunts I do during the year. I get plenty of grinding in and um, it is nice to have this one hunt, you know, for a week or so that I go up, I'm still sitting in a stand for 10 hours a day. Right. Uh, you know, freezing cold, um, that hunt's not for everybody, right? Like it, it's, it's awful to some people, but I, I love it. He's done most of the grinding and yeah. he puts me in a good spot and I appreciate him for it. But to go do that, that once a year, I'm all for it. Yeah. I think we need to make it okay again to just hunt comfortable. Yeah. Like if for so long, it's not cool to be comfortable. It's like, it's like, if you're not sleeping on the ground, you're not tough enough. If you don't, yeah. if you have an air pad, you're too, you're too soft. It's like, I don't know. I want to be comfortable. Like, yeah, I'm going to yeah. do the hard work. I'm not going to turn down shooting a bull in a, in a hole and packing it out of there. But sure. if I can be comfortable, why not? Like, it's just going to help me kill. Yeah. I, you know, you have that grind, like, like elk hunting, for example, I, like if you said, Rusty, you can only hunt one animal the rest of your life. What is it? It's elk with a bow and the rut for me. That's that's my baby. And it is awfully rewarding, right? When you have grinded and grinded and grinded and you're getting your butt kicked, your teeth are kicked in, and it comes together and it works. It's phenomenal and awesome. 
Um, but I'm totally fine with going on <laughs> being comfortable at the same time. And, you know, heaven forbid, one of these years when I hopefully kill one of these monsters, a big monster clay puts me on, um, more power to clay. Like, yeah, I, part of me, I, I want to land one of those for him too, just as much as I, you know, we all want to kill big deer. I want to get it, but, um, you know, more power to clay for being the stud that found it in the first place and put me on it. And, I'm totally fine with teaming up with him. He needs a killer. He finds him and he needs a killer. I'll come do that once a year. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. I mean, I I think that would be – I love type 2 fun too, you know, like the elk hunting. Mm -hmm. Like there's – it's – you know, you go up with clay and you shoot a big buck. You know, maybe if you've been going up for like six, seven years and you, and you finally got, you know, that big double drop, sure. yeah, you're going to get a huge serotonin hit. 100%. But it ain't going to be the same as you finding a public land bull in September seven miles back and pulling the trigger. And, and that feeling you get when your truck hits the last cattle gate on the way out of the mountain <laughs> and you look in the rear view and you can see those ivory tines sticking out of the box of your truck oh, and you're yeah. headed home like that. There is no replacing that. Yeah, and I think that's not. okay, too. I think you mix it in. I think a great season is a little bit of those. Some of those type twos probably earlier in the season because you got the energy, you've been working out all summer. And by the time you get to November, it's like I'm all for a type one, just fun. It's not hard, camaraderie. We got a deer camp going on, a bunch of cool guys are in camp, or, yep. you know, have it's getting dark early, so we're having bonfires. You know, you never, when we elk hunt, unless it's like the last day and we're just packing up tomorrow, we never stay up late and have a bonfire. And I know a lot oh, of yeah. people are going to say like, Oh, that's part of elk camp for me. It's like, no, I'm there to kill. We get home, we make food, we go to bed. Yep. Like it's nine o'clock, 10 o'clock. By the time we roll into clamp, we, a lot of times it's like, what's the easiest thing we can make for dinner. Sure. And then we, we all go to bed. And so I kind of, you kind of miss a little bit of that too. It's fun to have a bonfire on the mountain and yeah. stay up way later <laughs> than you should. And that you, that's a great time to do it. in those type one, hunts like i'm always thinking we should do like an antelope camp because yeah. everyone talks about deer camp everyone's got their elk camp you try to go elk hunting with like if i went elk hunting with you i'd be like hey rusty let's do an elk hunt and you're like well okay but you know i got this hunt in september in idaho and then i got this hunt already and it's like yeah i got that week book too and all of a sudden it's like well we already got our elk camp traditions but sure. no one has an antelope camp yeah yeah they don't an antelope's a good example like both Type one? both, both yeah. types of both types of fun are okay and that's how I am. Every time I get an antelope tag, uh, it's like, man, this is a fun hunt. Like, yeah. you know, like yeah, I get the I get the Mountain Dews and the the chips in the truck, and you're out glassing and looking for the one you want. It's a fun hunt to do with buddies, in my opinion. Buddies where... with great senses of humor, like yes. Like, can you imagine a truck full of four comedians <laughs> hopped up on Mountain Dew and and Doritos yeah. looking for? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'd be great. My yeah, wife wants to does. do it because um, she just got done with residency and uh, and now she's getting into hunting. She just bought a brand new Hoyt and then she smoked a buck at twelve yards on our new farm here. We just nice. moved in, so now she's kind of looking at me like. You know, Mr. Big Bow Hunter over there, you haven't ever shot a buck with your bow because I've never seen one that I wanted to shoot. Um, and she shot one on the first season with her brand new Hoyt. So she's, and I shoot a Matthew, so she's laughing at me for that. And, but now she wants to do the antelope hunt because she watched Randy Newberg. Uh -huh. And he gets up just normal, like a normal 6, 7 a.m., sun's peeking up. They go by the gas station, grab a box of donuts, and and it's just a fun hunt, and they're yeah. laughing the whole time. And she's like, "I want to do that," and I'm like, "I do too. I really want to do that." Yeah, it is. It's fun. I I consider some guys might differ with me, but I consider spring spot and stock bear hunting very similar. It's like those bears aren't up at the crack of dawn. We we sleep in on the spring bear hunt, uh, you know, and get out and start heading in mid morning to go hunt our bears uh, when we do it. So it's kind of like antelope to me. I'm not in that. Uh, I'm going to be hiking it. 4 a.m. and get back yeah. in there. Yeah, Same can you imagine somebody? Can you imagine if you went on an antelope hunt with a guy and he's like, "What time do you want to wake up? Like 3:30, 3:45?" <laughs> yeah. And you're like, "What? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm yeah. not waking up then." Oh, yeah, nice. I like shed hunting for that reason. It's just there's no pressure. Yeah, go when you want to go. And you're not. Stay you back. never. You know what the thing? The nice thing about shed hunting is you're never like, ah, I don't want to fill my tag on that one. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yep. 
If you want, you can throw that antler into the bushes if you don't want to carry it home. Or see how far you can throw a caribou head. Uh, yeah, we've done that. We've done that twice. <laughs> I watched that. You, I, I almost thought you lived in Canada from the number of caribou videos. And I'm usually, I mean, I'm doing this a while, so I'm usually okay with picking out like, ah, this guy just w- took a lot of content on one hunt. Right. You know, but I'm like, oh, he's wearing this and this picture and that and that picture. And, you know, this, you know, this was a, you know, sunny picture and the other one was cloudy. Like you can tell it's different, you know, snow on the ground, not snow on the ground. So you can, you must have done the caribou thing a few times. Two. I've done it twice. Yeah, I've done it twice. But uh, don't get me wrong. I took a lot of footage and a lot of pictures on those hunts Two, two very different hunts, even though they're in the same part of the world, but epic one of one of them i just did here in august with a good buddy and it was pictures video and my stories will never be able to depict how epic that trip i did in august was like my buddy and i'll shoot a text to each other once in a while and recall we're like dude that trip was so epic that's like all we got to say yeah um absolutely epic but yeah love even though i've only done twice absolutely love hunting caribou that's another hunt that i would have no problem as long as i could afford it to do it every single year, I'd be happy. Are you able to do that one DIY or are you in a unit where you needed a guide? Yeah, D- we do a DIY drop camp. So okay. there's basically a transporter and a plane. You can take your all your own gear. They still fly you in or you can use their gear, which is a nice way to go. You don't got to do the logistics of getting, you know, traveling with fuel for a stove or stuff like that. Um, they provide the tent, the cots, the cooking stove a pile of food, they dump you in the Arctic and go, we'll see you in seven days. Yeah. Um, it's fun. You know what's crazy? I listened to a podcast with Randy Newberg and John Nosler, and both of them were in Alaska for 9-11 and got stranded because they shut down all flight, and the <clears> bush <throat> pilots are like, you guys are going to kill people. Like, there's people out there that are, were expecting us to come get them 14 days ago. Yeah. And you're like, yeah. yeah, we got stuck for 14 days. And then luckily we got back to Anchorage and then we were stuck for like another 14 days because the bush pilots just came and picked us up. I don't know if they were supposed to or not, but then like the commercial flights were still down. Yeah. Yeah. It's Alaska in general. Like that's terrible on 9-11 because there's no option, even if the weather's good. But yeah, I've got bad. buddies. Yeah. I've got buddies that have been stranded for 12 days straight because of weather. 12 um, days after they were supposed to get picked up. Um. Not 12 days after, but like a five-day hunt, but they were there for 12 till a plane could finally come get them. What were they doing for food? Just catching fish and shooting stuff? That's what's crazy. Like like the drop camp that we use, these guys provide you with a lot of food. Like we, we've never been able to eat everything they send. Um, but in a perfect world, you hope you've killed a caribou. Yeah. Uh, and, and now you got plenty of food that way. But yep, if you're on a river or a lake, you got fish opportunities and stuff as well. But it got a little sketchy for the buddies How, that were there for 12. I, I'm sure they got this figured out, but I assume you want to go with like a service when you fly in. And so like, so I'm picturing like, you're like looking for ways and you Google and stuff. You're like, Oh, I found this guy. His name's Richard. He's got a plane. He's going to fly <laughs> us in. And you know, he, yeah. he told us to meet here on the dock and we're here and he flies in. And then like Richard dies while you're there and no one knows you're in the back country. Like you want to go with the service where there's like a whiteboard and it says rusty Smith on this pass. We got to pick him up on the 12th. And if your yes. pilot gets sick, at least someone else will be like, Oh shit, we forgot about rusty. Let's go get him. <laughs> Absolutely. And so the, the place I use um, is through Outdoors International. So Outdoors International is a booking service, booking agency. Um, I actually do some hunt consulting for them and do some booking for them. And uh, they basically do booking for these different places. They, you know, they take care of the, the marketing for these places because they don't want to do it. They don't want to talk to a, the, you know, the outfits don't want to talk to 100 people and book two. So they have these guys do it for them. And uh, that's what we are. It's It's outlined. You got this many hunters. It is exactly what you said. It's a whiteboard, basically a map. This is where these guys are at and it's all recorded. There's multiple people taking care of the logistics of it. Um, Worst case scenario, you know, uh, search and rescue could come get you if it gets real ugly. But uh, yeah, you're not going in there, I suppose, without an inReach. And so you're like, okay, we're supposed to get picked up 10 days ago. Like we've been here for 17 (laughs) days. I'm going to hit the button. 
Yeah. Or I'm yeah, going to start is. texting people like, hey, is someone coming to get us? Hey, you know, might have to have a couple of contacts back in Juneau or wherever Fairbanks is lined up. Yeah, because you're out there. We we go out of uh, Kotzebue, Alaska. So Kotzebue's, you know, western, northwestern Alaska. You're barely below the Arctic Circle line. And then you're hopping in, you know, a Cessna 180 or a Beaver plane or a Super Cub. And you're, we're flying 170 miles north into the Arctic. So you're in the Brooks Range, yeah. 170 miles from the nearest native village. <laughs> it's, it's pretty wow. crazy. That is in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, you yeah. have to have some trust in your plan at that point. You go with a friend that you trust, too. Like, I've, both times I've done it, there's been two of us. Guys will do groups of four or whatever. But uh, you you go with a person you trust. You got Arctic Grizzlies there. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's crazy stuff. So you, you make sure you do it with a guy you trust, not just your neighbor from down the street that said, I want to go on a hunt. Well, that's a very like big concern. And I, it, I feel bad for folks. Cause you know, I have my own group and crew and I, and I've done it enough that now I kind of understand how to pick a partner, but you get so many requests of people, a guy at your church or a guy at work or a guy in your neighborhood. He's like, Oh man, I'd love to do that. And, you know, maybe if it's like a local thing, it's like, yeah, we'll come on over on Saturday. We'll go out or something. That's one thing. But on a big hunt, usually you're like, well, I got my group. Group's kind of full. And so you see people like, hey, I'm going with a guy from work. I'm going from a guy from church or whatever. I found a buddy. I'm like, oh, boy. (laughs) Like, (laughs) Like, I hope it works out for you, man. But, like, if you've never hunted with this person and you're not friends with this person, like, you're going to run into some issues. Like we've had stories of people where it's like four groups of four. And it's like, these two guys want to go. There's an elk at a mile. There's an elk right there at a mile away. And they're like, let's go. We got four hours. And the other group's like, Oh, I'm not working over there. Are you nuts? (laughs) Yep. And you're like, well, now what do we do for nine days? Hope they're in camp. Yeah. You know, that's I, if I go caribou hunting, I'm bear hunting, uh, you know, we're chasing cats, whatever. I got that little group of people, family, and some close buddies. My my hunting circle's pretty small. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I get hit up constantly about, especially mountain lions. We get hit up so much for that, a ton for elk, etc. But even my good buddies, I hunt bears and all that stuff with. I'm when it comes to elk, I'm a solo elk hunter. Like somebody's like, ah, I want to come with you. I'm just like, I, ah, I don't want somebody to be there. This is my sacred time, and. Uh, that's what the elk hunt is to me is the sacred time. And I'm a solo, solo guy. And when I do have somebody with me, I get anxiety. I get anxiety over that. Like, Oh, this guy doesn't screw it up. Or, or I get pressure of, I don't want to screw something up for him. When yeah. it's me, when it's just me, if I screw it up, I screwed it up. If I made it work, I made it work. Yeah. Well, so when you're solo elk hunting, I mean, you've shot a lot of elk. Okay? Just looking at all yeah. the pictures, are you doing mostly like spot and stock sneaking in on them? Or, I mean, are you trying to call and then run up so you don't get windowed or what's going on? Yeah. Great question. I, to kind of answer that, I started back up a little history. I started archery elk hunting. I shot my first bull when I was 13. I shot one with a rifle before that, but with a bow 13 and my brother-in-laws who got me into it. My family wasn't archery hunters. My dad got my brother and I bows when we were like 10 years old, like our Hoyt Ram Hunter compound bows. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, my brother-in-law, they hunted elk and they were waterhole guys. They'd find water holes, they'd set up a tree stand and they would sit water holes and ambush, right? Wait for them to come in. And so that's what he took me to go do. And I, I sat a lot of water holes sat a few wallows that my brother and I, when I was in high school, started calling them. And we'd uh, killed multiple bulls, bugling them in, cow calling them in, et cetera. And that's the fun part everybody likes to do, right? It's fun. It's exciting. Over the last eight to 10 years, gosh, the last like eight or nine bulls I've killed, I've never called to them. I, I'm a leave my call in my pocket or my reed in my mouth to stop that bull Right, before yeah. I send one through the pump house, um, I mostly stock them now. Like, is what changed for me is it was like I got sick of killing satellite bulls, you know, a two seventy six right. point or whatever, and I, I'm like, I want to kill the herd bull, and we chased 
so many herd bulls, right? Everybody's done it. You're chasing them. They're screaming back at you, so it's exciting. But they're just talking to you as they move their ladies away. Right. And and it's so hard to hunt a herd bull. And I started learning if I want to kill a herd bull, there's some other techniques and methods to do it. And I've, I've, I've done a pretty good job of figuring most of those out. And I feel like if I can find a good herd bull, if I got enough opportunities, I can kill him. I can kill yeah. him. It's most, mostly, I'm mostly stalking him. So you gotta, so you gotta find them first. So it's kind of hard. You gotta hunt places where you can see them. Like you can't hunt solid black timber too. Long. Yeah, it's tough. I, I will hunt in the timber, um, but it's a lot of locating where they're at at daylight, right? Where they're feeding. Like elk in general will come. I mean, depending where you're hunting, right? But in general, in the West, elk are coming down to feed at night. And they're usually moving back up into their bedding areas is pretty much mostly the standard in the West. Yeah. Obviously it varies from place to place, but you know, you figure that out in the area you're hunting. So I know they're down. So I'll hit the lower elevations and levels. I will, I will be in there at three in the morning if I have to listen to a bugle so I can find where the herd is at three in the morning. And I will get within 600 yards of that herd and sit and listen to them and listen to them and I'll try and get to where I'm within 200 yards by legal shooting light, play the wind, because your problem, you know, getting, your, your wind's coming down in the morning normally. Right. Sun's, sun's got to come up, thermal's got to shift, and if you can with the terrain, I want to play it where when the thermals shift, I'm in the perfect place to cut them off or take an angle in on them with the wind. I've killed a lot of bulls where the wind is really scary. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they're about to get me. Um, so I'll, I'll do that. I, I killed a bull last year, um, a great bull, three, a 350 bull with my bow. I was in there at 3.30 in the morning. I watched him on day one. He had 24 cows already. I couldn't get on, on him, so I let him bed. He never came out at night. So I went back to where I found him the next day at 3.30 in the morning until I recognized his bugle and did exactly what I just described him at about I don't know, 35, 40 minutes after legal shooting line, I put an arrow through the pump station, um, just getting in the way of that herd as they came by. You were on the mountain at 3.30 or you left like, you on left to go? No, oh my gosh, you're waking up at like midnight and going out. Yeah, like we, I don't know if you've ever done this, we used to, my brother and I, we used to go out into areas where we could take like, you know, ATVs where you got roads through forest service, whatever. And we would go out at two thirty, three 3 in the morning. He'd go this way. I'd go that way. I'd drive out to a point. I'd bugle, sit and listen for five minutes. And he and I would each do that for like an hour and a half to two hours, meet back at a spot and go, what do you have? I got two bulls in this, screaming down in this Canyon. I got a bull in this Canyon. And then we'd make a plan on whoever had the most bulls screaming. And we'd take off and it's only five in the morning and we're taking off into that canyon at 5 a.m. to get on them. I use the same strategy, except for if I have a specific target bowl, I'll, I'll be there at 3.34 in the morning. I don't care. So can you do that like day in and day out or do eventually you just run out of go because you're not sleep? I mean, you're, you, I don't know where you hunt, but typically like we don't get to bed until nine or ten. Very rarely are we sleeping before 10. So if you're waking up at like midnight, one o'clock and getting on the mountain at three, like that's only like two hours of sleep. Yeah. A lot of times the way I'll do it, we, I will all grind and grind and I get, I go without a lot of sleep in September, <laughs> but on that hill, if I got a scenario like that and they get past me and they move up into that thick timber in the bedding area, don't get me wrong. Once in a blue moon, I've followed them and I've killed a few bulls laying in their bed in their bedding area before. I've, I've done it a couple of times, but if I can't keep up to them, if there's too many eyes and ears and I don't want to blow it, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll go lay down under a tree and sleep for four hours until evening. You know, okay. So you're just uh, catching up on your sleep and then when you don't have anything going on. Yeah. If I can, I'll, I'll take a nap somewhere, but if I got to just do it day after day after day, I'll do it. <laughs> Yeah, we've we've done the early thing, and to get out there early enough to make sense, I mean, you got to get up early, early, and so then lately, like, and we don't typically have a lot of success in the mornings. Um, we're hunting general units typically. We're usually hunting new units, and so it's like we're trying to find spots, and and so typically we find most of our success like early afternoon and evening. Mm. I mean, that's when we've shot. 
I think one person shot one bull in the morning, all but right. all the rest of our bulls have been after lunch. Right on. So yeah, I've, I have a mix. I, I, I killed two bulls this year. I killed one of them in the, in the evening and killed the other one in the morning. Yeah. Um, I like mornings a lot cause I feel like I can kind of pattern them unless there's so much pressure, they get bumped a lot. But, uh, um, I like that I can find them at night cause I don't seem to have any competition when I'm laying there at three 30 or four in the morning, listening for them. No, you uh, definitely don't. Not for me anyway. <laughs> yeah. So I like the morning scenario cause I can know where they're at before it's light. Right. Um, but I'll, I'll hunt them just as much in the evening too, but, but I do like mornings. Yeah. How, so are you taking like the, to do two elk hunts, unless you just bam, bam, like on a weekend warrior style, you must be taking like a majority of the fall off to do all these hunts. Is like, are you somehow doing this for your full-time job or how does that work? Oh, man, I wish, um, <laughs> if somebody out there wants to pay me to just hunt, uh, give me a call. Uh, no, I'm a, I'm a salesman. So, uh, I've worked in sales for gosh, nine years. And it used to be I was on a nine to five job in the white collar world and I'd save all my vacation and just use it in September and October and a little bit in December to chase cats. And when I started into sales, it got to where that's when I started hunting multiple states, started apply, applying all over the place. So I learned real quick with sales, if you work the right kind of sales job, um, it's not that sour salary paychecks, the same every two weeks or the, I work this many hours. It's if I want to make more money or I want to go buy a new bow or a gun, I go make a few more sales. Um, yeah. and so I've learned to work hard, really hard when I'm working, um, so that it pays off when I'm, I, I mean, there's nothing like hunting and I got phone service and ding, there's a purchase order, you know, and I'm, I'm out on the mountain. It's awesome. Yeah, so, I mean, I've done that before. I got a some. I have a bill, uh, beard oil company, uh, Bull Elk Beard Oil. And this year, while I was elk hunting, I was check. I turned my service on to check text messages, and bing, order yeah, came bing. in. I was like, nice, got paid. Yeah. Today. Now, obviously, not nearly as much as I spent that day in Colorado, but sure. Yeah, yeah. I I do take a lot, and September is probably the most. I. Gosh, our, our archery hunt opened August 30th, and it goes to the end of September, so there's 32 days to hunt. I killed my first bull on September 1st, the third day, and then I hunted for my second bull tag that I'd had, and I, I killed him on the 20th. Um, I believe out of those 22 days, gosh, I think I hunted 18 of them. That's crazy. Yeah. Especially, like, when you're, from, when you're from Idaho, though, like, you know, you can yeah. hunt and come home at night and be with the family. Yeah, Whereas, so you get get the right tag or the right unit where you don't have to travel and you can run yeah. home. It makes a big difference. Yeah, I love that about this farm that we just bought is I can, like we got a room right down there with gun safe in it and all my clothes and my bow and I just get dressed and walk out the back and yeah. we got 40 acres to go tree stands and stuff and I can come back in for dinner. Like, it, you know, it's not even late. Yeah, it's like going on that outfitted hunt right there. See, that would be nice. Yeah. Bed. <laughs> I would love. So one of the things that I haven't had the opportunity to do yet is a mule deer hunt where I had the, where I could pass bucks. Mm -hmm. Every mule deer hunt I've ever been on, whether between poor planning or droughts or pressure, it's you, you find out real fast, mm -hmm. like one or two days in, we're like, Oh, I better shoot the first buck I see. Cause it's going to be the only buck I see Ooh. and every mule deer hunt I've been on. I shot the biggest, the first year I shot on the last day. And it was the first like decent buck I had seen. Oh, wow. And so jet, you know, Southeast Montana and, you know, general random units in Wyoming and, you know, but I want to go on that mule deer hunt where you can look at some bucks and you can yeah. be like, mm, like an antelope hunt in a way and be able to look at a couple good bucks and pass. And then, you know, maybe, maybe you pass too many of them and you don't tag anything, but it'd still be sure. just fun to look at some bucks and shoot a nice, you know, I'm not even talking 170, 180 or like that, whatever you shot, that 210 incher, um, the, just like a nice 154 point would be great. <laughs> oh, you can do it. I can help you out. That's, that's not too, we can find that for you. Oh, I know they're out there. That's the problem. <laughs> I know they're out there. I'm like, oh man, and, you know, we went to Southeast Montana and I'll let, I'll let this one out of the bag. Don't go to Southeast Montana. Give it some time. <laughs> so 
we went there. And, the, you know, Southeast Montana had its glory days back in, like, the 90s and the early 2000s before people had the internet. <laughs> yeah. And the people were smoking giant bucks out there. And so we were, we were going to go, and it was a buddy that I brought with, and he had never hunted the West, but he's an avid deer hunter. And, you know, I told him, hey, it's going to be rough. Like, there's going to be a lot of pressure, and we're not going to see toads. Like, it's this is an opportunity hunt. We're going to look at a lot of two-year-old bucks, and then eventually we'll probably find a three-year-old to shoot them. We got out there and we couldn't even find a mule deer to save our lives. It was 75 degrees on, on November 20th. And oh, there was three trucks on every corner of every public and it was awful. And so my buddy passed a four by four on the first day, probably a two year old four by four, you know, those little two by four. Yeah. four by, he passed one of those on the first day, never saw a bigger buck. Oh geez. So he shot a three by three and then on the, and then, we got that broke down. We went down to town, grab a burger, went back up into the hills. And I'm like, we got to leave. I, I had a, I had to go see my fiance for a Thanksgiving um, shindig the next day. I had like 36 hours and I'm in Montana and she lives basically in Wisconsin. <laughs> and so we go back out and we find this buck and I crawl in mm. and he is sleeping up on a ridge with terrible wind. There's no way to get to him. And the, there's such a bad drought. The grass was like a centimeter long. So I couldn't even crawl. I'm like trying to crawl behind cactuses and bushes and like, you know, hide. And eventually yeah. I got, you know, skyline and he opened his eyes and he's looking right at me. And I'm like, well, I guess this is why I built this rifle. I'm taking this 496 <laughs> yard shot and um, got the bipod set up, laying prone, drilled him. And uh, so it's like, okay, this went from the world's worst mule deer hunt to we both tagged out on the last day within yeah. three hours. There you go. So packed up, <laughs> headed home, drove straight through the night, and got to Thanksgiving on time. You got the experience of the grind and got the glory at the end. Oh, it was <laughs> too. Yeah, it was a. I mean, and this is like the first time we've hunted the West together, and you know, we start tensions are starting to like boil up because you're, <laughs> you're not. We're not seeing anything. Yeah, there's a million and one whitetails in private, yeah. and there's even more trucks than that, and no mule deer and no mule deer bucks. So, I think it's just bad luck. I think <laughs> I've maybe picked a couple of spots that could have been better, um, but that's the next thing on like my list, my wife's list, yeah. antelope. My list is that a good mule deer hunt because I've shot some beautiful bulls, not as many as you, of course, but. Um, you know, I've, I've done the nice elk thing. I've got a couple ones at home, ones at the taxidermist. So I've kind of scratched that itch for now. I still go elk hunting every year, but the, sure. the new itch is the, the big mule deer. Big mule deer, huh? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're there. They take, they take some work. Big mule deer, are usually not easy to come by. That's for sure. Um, What's crazy. It's easier to shoot a big elk than a big mule deer. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I, I have, uh. I have some buddies that are just die hard, die hard mule deer guys, and I love it. They're I, mule deer rule. Everything else takes you know third fiddle to it, and uh, and we we like to harass each other and joke a lot because I'm a I'm an elk guy. Like uh, I've killed some big mule deer, but uh, my fun level is way up here with elk. Yeah. Um, my I love and probably appreciate a big mule deer more than I do a big elk, but my fun level isn't as high when I'm hunting them. Um, and so they like to give me a hard time all the time about it. But, uh, but a big mule deer, you put your hands on a big mule deer that you grinded for. It's, it's awesome. Very we awesome. went to, uh, s uh, Southwest Colorado shed hunting with a previous podcast guest, Steven Walker. And he finds a ton of sheds and we get to his house and he's like, Hey, look at this. And he, he walks over and he had him on a, like a, it was like a buffet table, like out next to his dining room table, but it wasn't set up to serve. It was just these two antlers and he picks them up and it was like a 208 inch match set of mule deer sheds. Wow. And the thing was, they were clean four by fours. I believe. Oh yeah. So huge, huge, just huge. And yeah, and he was, and you know, we're holding them like white tails with like a 16 inch spread. He's like, no, no, they're both. <laughs> no, it's out here. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, he said he found them both on the same day too. Nice. Like, yeah. 80 yards apart or something like that. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine finding a 200 inch mule deer. Like I'm like, I'm looking for a 140 or a 150. Like I know my bar is pretty low as mule deer go. And there he is with a set of 208 inch sheds. 
Yeah, yeah, big, big mule deer sheds are fun to hold. I, I've had a hard time mounting some of my big ones because I like to pick them up and hold them. <laughs> you should just put rods in them. I know. I've totally thought about it. I there was something in my head about not wanting to break up that skull plate um, on the ones well, I've killed, but unless you're going to put it in the book, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And I, I've, I've never entered anything in the books. So yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just something mental in my head. It's like, oh, I, I don't know if I want to. My taxidermist did that on my bull elk. Um, cause he has a basement shop. And so he's like, uh -huh. oh, first of all, I'm not going to get it out of here yeah. once I mount it, just so you know. And I'm like, well, what do you, what do we do? Like, can you mount it in your garage or something? And he's like, well, not really. And he's like, but you're also not going to get it in your house either. So yeah. we got to peg it. And I'm like, what do you mean? And so he's like, well, I'm going to put it, I'm going to drill a hole through it. And so that way I have the hole to line it up. And then I cut the antler off and put a rod in. And, yep. and I'm like, I don't know. Sounds like I get to pick up a 350 inch set of sheds. And he's like, yep, basically. And so I yeah. told I told my next taxidermist cause he quit doing elk after that. He said, I, I'm, my back's too bad. I can't hip, pick him up and put him on the, you know, on his mount yeah. to do all the work. And he's like, it's hard on my back. So I'm done with elk. And I'm like, ah, shoot. So I found a new taxidermist, had him on the podcast too, from North Dakota. And I'm like, Hey, you better peg these. I want to be able to pick the sheds up. And he's like, Oh dude, I love when customers let me put pegs in. Yeah. There. And with elk, a lot of times you have to, I have a bull being mounted right now. And yeah, it's like, I, I'm not getting him in a house. I, I don't have a shop door into my house. So it's like, he's being pegged no matter what, or I'm not getting him in. Well, I've only shot narrow bulls, which is crazy. The 354 only has a 33 or 34 inch inside spread. Uh, and it's where his whale tails actually go out. His, in, yeah. his like true insides from like third to third is only 31 inches. Huh. I think it, I think when those bulls hit that like 40 or 45 inches wide, they oh. look so much bigger, even though they're probably not as big. Sure. Yeah. Like maybe score wise or whatever, not much bigger. But when you see that just giant frame. Yeah. It's impressive. But if you do like a half, well, let me think. No, it probably doesn't even matter. If you did a straight up, you, you're not getting it in because the, you know, you're 45 inches wide and a normal door is like 31 inches. Oh, and yeah. even if you turn it sideways, then you got to get that shoulder and that shoulder. Like, you're just not getting to the thing in here. Yeah, it's like, which way are you trying to mount that head to get it in? Yeah, the, t the taxidermist mountain mine right now, it's rare he mounts a bull that is not pegged. Um, it's got to be somebody that, like, that's a question. Are you going to get this in your house? And most of the time it's no. Yeah, it's got to uh, be like a shop. Like, yep. yeah, I'm going to put it in my shop. <laughs> or the shop or the garage or something. Then he can leave it the way it is, but... Yeah, there's something about holding them. Are you a big taxidermy guy? Are you doing like shoulder mounts on all your bulls? Because you shot a lot of nice bulls. No, you know, uh, the bull that I have being mounted right now is the first elk I've ever mounted. I do a ton of euros. Okay. Um, I can be wrong. There's plenty of heads in the house. Like I got a, a moose head in my living room, a caribou head, a couple of white tails, a couple of muleys, uh, an axis deer all in my living room. And then I got a bunch, you know, I got a sick of black tail mount downstairs, some wolf rugs, a full mount wolf, a few things like that. But I hunt enough. I, I don't know. I don't have space for the ones I do mount, <laughs> let, alone, yeah. let alone the others. And elk take up so much space. I, Oh my God. Well, talk about the space that moose you got probably takes up the most. Yeah. He was a, a shyress, uh, I get hate for that, but when I was 12 years old in Idaho, I drew my once-in-a-lifetime moose tag the first time I ever put in in Idaho. Hey, we can be part of the club. I drew my once-in-a-lifetime North Dakota the first year I put in for it. That's where I shot the 354. Yeah, the club. The club's good. One percenter club. Yeah, I don't know what your odds were for the Idaho one, but the, mule, the elk tag I drew in North Dakota was like 0.75% chance. Yeah, not good. I, I couldn't tell you what my odds were. I was 12 years old and didn't have the internet. and You didn't even apply. Your dad did for you. Yeah, my, exactly. My dad applied for me. There were three tags given is all I know, but I don't know how many people applied. But I got one of those three tags at 12 years old. And that's the last time I ever drew a tag in Idaho. I've never drawn an elk tag. I've never drawn a deer tag. And I've never drawn an antelope tag in Idaho. All I've drawn is that moose when I'm 12. Would you take it back then? Like if that's if like if someone at the game and fish told you like yeah, we keep throwing your name out because you drew that moose. Would you be like, <laughs> well uh, now I wish I would have never drawn the moose. 
No, it was it was awesome. And you know, a lot of people are like, ah, you were so young. Wouldn't you like to do it later? It was awesome. I got to hunt that with my dad and my grandpa. And the the year after that hunt um, with my grandpa, my grandpa passed away from cancer. Um, and so I got my dad had a mountain goat tag that same year. So we hunted my moose, me and grandpa and dad, and then we went and hunted dad's mountain goat, me and grandpa and dad. And those were the last hunts I ever got to do with him. It was a handful of months later he got diagnosed, you know, and then made it a while longer. So I, the, the memories and the experience I had with him would make it so I would never, ever take that back. I'd happily give up uh, drawn deer and elk tags in exchange for what that moose experience was. And to be honest, most of the time I'm doing fine on my general tags. So it's yeah, okay. no, you're, you're doing plenty fine on your general tags. I'm looking at the picture right here from the Wasatch front. <laughs> it's <that's laughs> So story behind that, a majority of my posts will say something about the Wasatch front. None of those animals are killed on the Wasatch front. Oh, uh, well, you no. know what elk I'm talking about is a stud elk. <laughs> yeah. Was that just the recent one, six by seven? Yeah, Probably. let's see here. One, two, three, four. Yeah, that's, that's six by seven. Okay. Yep, that was the last one I shot this year then. Yeah, I have a buddy that does that on Instagram too, but he'll do like, sometimes he makes it tricky. Like you think he could actually be, like he'll shoot a monster whitetail and be like, God, I love Kansas. And I, <laughs> yeah, I work with him, so I knew he was in like South Dakota. Sure, yeah. You know, or he'll do stuff like, you know, your mom's 40 you know, back 40 or yeah. <laughs> stuff like that. I do a lot of your mom's house or most of my Wasatch fronts are like Wasatch front CrossFit or Wasatch front Kia or, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's what this one was. This was okay. front Kia, but okay. yeah, that's us. Uh, do you ever uh, age your bulls? Do you ever pull out a tooth and age them? You know, I, I haven't on elk. I, I've, I've really enjoyed doing that on deer the last gosh, three to four years. I started doing it on a lot of deer. Like debated, white tails or mule deer? Um, mule deer. Okay, I've, yeah. I've, I've done it on a couple of white tails, but mule deer is where I got the first itch to do it. Um, I had uh, a friend, um, some people might know who he is, Travis Hobbs, just a mule deer uh, killing machine. He killed a buck. He's, he's the reason I aged him. He killed a buck in velvet that was over 200 inches and set the tooth in and it came back at three and a half years old. Oh my God. Um, you know, wicked, wicked genetics. Record. Yeah, wicked genetics, young deer. And it got me going, man, I've always thought I kind of could age these deer, you know, swayed backs, Roman noses, looking at their teeth. And it made me start to send some in and go, how bad am I really at, at guessing the age on some of these? And, and it's impressed me. I, I killed a mule deer in 2020 that when I shot him, if you just said, Rusty, how old do you think he is? I'm like, dude, this deer's seven years old, swayed back, big old Roman nose, curled hooves. And then I cape him out and I'm looking at his teeth going, his teeth don't look seven years old. And uh, I send him in um, four and a half years old, 214 and change inch buck at four and a half. That was your, that's the five by four? No, no, this is a different buck. He's got a drop tine hanging off of him. Okay. Um, got some inline, some non-typical stuff. It was back in 2020, and that blew my mind too. Because then I'm going, man, what could he have been at five and a half, six and a half? Right. Um, but if you if you'd asked me, even looking at him on the hoof all day long, I'd have told you he was six to seven years old. Um, until I looked at those teeth, so it's fun. I think yeah. I've enjoyed sending them in and seeing what they come back as. Educational. Yeah, I, I like to do it on all the whitetails we shoot. Um, we shot a buck at the family farm kind of spot and stock his last day of gun season and this buck's chasing and out in the middle of a plowed field on our farm and so we went and tried to sneak up on him he you know back and forth ping pong never get a shot he beds down in the middle of a crp field like crp grass like you know just prairie grass yeah you know four feet tall and so me and my brother just sneak up he moves up five yards and i cover and then i move up and we're doing this like we're doing the pinch kind of like at from a v yeah. And eventually we both see his antler in the, in the grass. And so he, I'm like, Hey, you, you know, yeah. Is he a shooter? And I said, yeah, he's a shooter. Well, he shoots, 
he like tracked the antler down. He's trying to shoot him in the head at 35 yards, but he like picked the wrong ear. Like he thought he was shooting on the left side of the ear, and it turns out he should have shot on the right side of the ear. So he just probably gave him a headache. So he, and then his gun jams. So I hit the deck because the deer jumps up and he's shooting, or I thought he was going to shoot. He never shoots. So I stand up, deer runs right by me. I shoot at it. I put a lethal shot in it. Turns out this buck, 157 and a half inch whitetail, three and a half years old. Oh, geez. And the same thing. It's like, man, what would he have been at five? Yeah. You know, we would have looked at that deer all day long. He had junk. He was a 13. He had split brows and kickers everywhere. We would have thought for sure he's like four or five, six years old, maybe even like, you know, older. He's getting all that gnarly junk on him. Yeah. No, three and a half years old. Just just enter in his prime. I've, I've determined the bucks that have the legitimate genetics, they got them and they get big real quick. And then you got those other deer that, uh, you know, maybe in a whitetail world, they're, you got some of those that are never even going to go over 150 their whole life. Mule deer, I see that all the time. You'll have a buck that is never going to get out of the 170s ever. It doesn't matter how long he lives. He yeah. just, doesn't, just doesn't have the genetics for it. You can't see it. It's on the side of my uh, screen, but one of those sheds on the top row. The top row sheds are all special sheds. There's 10 of them. Uh, they have to have size and a story to get on the top uh, row. But the first shed I ever found was a shed off our own farm. And it was a big, heavy deer with a kicker. And I chased them all fall, didn't get them, found the shed the next year. Then my dad shot that buck the following fall. Mm. Six years old, 115 inches. Huh. Yeah. Just it's crazy. Just didn't have it. Just didn't have it. Yeah. He was a little bit bigger as a five-year-old. But even then, like only 130 maybe. You know, he just, like you said, didn't have it. Like it's just some. it's crazy because I feel like there's just so many – people out there that'll tell you like oh six and a half they're a giant or this or that i'm like ah, it seems like they're just random just like people some yeah. people are michael jordans and some people are brian krebs's and can't dunk to save yep. their life <laughs> <laughs> yep it's true it's my my buddy up in canada he's got a buck he's watching now that um they're pretty positive he's three and a half um and you can tell he's small framed white tail but he's got like eight points on one side, nine on the other, three drop times. And we're just going, man, if he can make it to like five or six. Oh, my gosh. He, yeah. He's one of those ridiculous potential bucks. But you look at other bucks that are the same age as him and, you know, they're they're a, a three by three, a six point white tail. Yeah. And the frame's the same size, but he's got a whole lot more going on. That's crazy. Does your friend find a lot of sheds up there then if he's got a lot of bucks? Yeah, he's he's got a shed pile in his lodge that I stand at that pile for hours and pick up and and just touch his antlers. And, fondle? <laughs> yes, I fondle them. Monster. Because where I didn't grow up with whitetails, you know, I grew up picking up yeah. mule deer sheds, elk sheds and stuff, and I pick up these whitetail, and it's it's kind of ruining me to want to hunt whitetails in some other places because they're they're massive. The mass they get up there is unreal. And I will just, I will just, he's got multiple sheds off like 200 inch, 190 inch white tails, just laying in a pile on his floor. They're unreal. I've seen, I've held a couple. I held one shed that scored 108. Just the side, just the one side scored. White tail. Yeah. White tail shed scored Man. 108 inches. Jeez. And the thing was, it's base was small. Oh, really? Very small. Yeah, my buddy uh, has the dead head and, like, a lot of the sheds is chasing him on his farm. It died on the neighbor's property. He bought the dead head for 500 bucks, and it was, like, a two-something. Oh. Jeez. Yeah, he's, like, he got the deal of a lifetime. But I have a shed on that wall. It's an eight-point, and the base on that whitetail shed, I can't even wrap my fingers around it. Oh, and I've found elk sheds, you know, that have, <laughs> like like, five- and six-point bulls. And it's the same base as like a six point, <laughs> like a small six point bull. It's crazy how much mass that one antler has. I love those. That's part of what I love about those deer in Canada is there is a mass genetic up there. Mass droppers and flyers is a genetic that exists up in there. And I'm I'm a mass guy all day. Like I'll I'll shoot a buck that'll score less if he's just got wicked chunky mass all over him. I don't care about the score like that mass i want to fondle it right it's awesome yeah i have a, yeah, i've been hearing that it's a popular thing with sheep hunters to euro their real skull and re 
get a replica That's for okay. their shoulder mount or their full body mount because mm-hmm. they want to be able to pick up that skull because it weighs so yeah. much. I've never picked one up. I have yeah. a buddy I could probably ask. He shot all four of them. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, he's, he's got a way around that. Yeah, but, yeah, I've heard that it's, like, it's so impressively heavy that you, like, when people, and they just want to put it on their desk and be like, pick that up. Yeah. You know, just when the people come <laughs> into their office, they're like, pick that up. And, you know, holy crap, this thing's heavy. Like, heavy, heavy. Not just yeah. like, a you know, an 11-pound shed. Like, the thing weighs like 40 pounds. Sure. Oh, yeah, totally heavy. I, I've i been impressed with, uh, like, musk ox heads for the same oh, reason. Oh, yeah, that would be a great just one. Just super dense and crazy heavy. And you're like, oh, yeah, it's a skull the size of a cow skull, whatever. And you pick it up, and it's just beefy, kind of like a bighorn sheep and... Uh, yeah, if I ever shoot one of those, I'm I'm leaving it as a skull that I can manhandle. Yeah, and there's a lot cool like retrofit and proto like not what's the right word for this like th- you can replicate them a lot easier than you used to be able to. Oh yeah, yeah, way easier. My I got a good buddy right now. He's got a little business going. He's 3D scans the animals, you know, and we'll make like you know the mini versions. Oh, mini mules like cameras. Like, yeah, it's like like the mini muleys. Instead of using pictures and running through a software, that we can scan the actual deer. Oh. So so like that big like two fifteen buck on the front of my page, we scanned it the other day, um, and we you know make a mini replica of the entire head, and we can put it on a euro. But at the same time, you now have a file he scanned. Yeah. Heaven forbid your house burns down or whatever it is, your trophy gets ruined or damaged. You could replicate it right off of that scanned file now yeah oh, who's that uh his name's johnny dietrich he's a local guy here getting started but it's uh it's pretty impressive because yeah the way scanners and printers 3d printers and stuff are going now they're just getting better and better and better so if you have a scan of your trophy and yeah falls off the wall and breaks into pieces you can't glue it together or the fire takes it whatever you have that file you can 3d print your trophy back out yeah we had um i've had so i have another podcast for like outdoor entrepreneurship people that start up outdoor businesses yeah. and brands and i love hearing the story and we had i've had both like cameron from mini me oh, yeah. on and i've had uh phil tuttle and um is it adam burke from antler tech huh. and they can it's like if you find a big shed and send it to them they'll scan it and they'll yeah. print the opposite side yeah so you can't find the opposite and they had a set of mule deer sheds that was probably 200 inches. And I'm just like, oh, my God. But, like, what's the weight? You know? Like like you said, yeah. like, if the weight's off, it, I'm going to know the difference. And he yeah. said, we weighed this one and that one, and there's a two-ounce difference between yeah, them. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. To, so, like, you can't tell. Like, he's a lot of people, they pick them up at shows, and they can't. He's like, guess which one's real and which one's fake. And they can't, they can't yeah. figure it out. They'll guess wrong all the time. You, you know what I would love to see with that technology, but you'd somehow have to get it popular enough. Like, I'm not a big fan of, like, the Boone and Crockett scoring system. There's, like, oh. so many flaws, right? Like to- Totally, yeah. But you, you'd have to rewrite the record books. But where you can scan these now, you can literally measure the exact volume of bone on top of a deer's head. So it's, it's similar to, like, water displacement, right? Yeah. Um, and I would love – I mean, you'd have to rewrite the record books. But with my buddy Johnny, we're doing a little experiment. We got – I got a couple bucks in my house here in that 214 to 215 range. My dad's got a 215 in his house. We're scanning all three of them. I'm going to measure the volume of bone on top of each of their head. So even though they score within one to two inches of each other, Boone and Crockett, it's going to be interesting to see which one's really the biggest as far as how much bone is up there. It's going to be Whichever one's got the most mass. Yeah, it's going to be my dad's. And uh, in my mind, that's... That's awesome. I think it's super cool. You, you might have a hard time. It should be. That it should always be the amount of bone. The only yeah. thing somebody could ever say, like, um, well, then you don't get the width. Like the width could be, but that's still like to me. If you had, um, in order to get wide, you need more antler to sure. go out. And if he doesn't have the width, like he isn't as big. Right. You know, he, he could have put that antler, that bone somewhere else. But if you like. And I, you know what is actually sad? It's very sad that this is the case. But the case that proves it is, like, look at the captive deer industry. Oh, yeah. Like, those bucks grow more antler. They're super ugly. I don't agree with it at all. I think it's really harmful to CWD and all these things. But that's the testament to, like, when they're truly healthy and the genetics are perfect, it's just about how many, how much mass, how many, yeah. like, grams of bone do they grow. 
and um and that would be a great way i would love to do it that way like and then you just cut them off yeah you could just cut off the sheds right at the pedicle and you know yep, weigh them. doesn't matter it yep, doesn't matter yeah or i just do the whole skull the euro like why does it why did why can't a skull count for how big he is like if he's got a thick head <laughs> like a bigger <laughs> nose like it should count i don't know yeah like, i love the ideas here I love the idea of just how much bone you would. You'd have the record books would be rewritten, but we're 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 going to play around with it with him for fun. Um, and you know, there's gonna... so many people though, like the silent majority, definitely does not like Boone and Crockett's yeah. system. I've talked to, I've heard, like I haven't talked to them. I've heard people describe why Boone and Crockett started, well, and I really do. Be, I I really do like what they stand for. Like if he goes back to their true mission. He says, well, Boone and Crockett started because we had market hunting and we had like it's brown, it's down hunting and all that stuff. And we needed to come out with a way that would incentivize people to take the healthiest animal for the health of the herd, which is a mature buck. Sure. Cause he's done his job. You can't take young bucks. You can't take does. Like if you want the health of the herd, the healthiest animal to take is the mature buck. But how do we incentivize yeah. that action? And, and, and then also how do we measure like the health of the herd? And so like, you know, semi, that was the way they could do it back then because they didn't have the technology we have today. Sure. And I get that. I think it's a great system. Like they found a way to incentivize quality deer management, like health, right? They gamified the system, right? Absolutely. You throw a number on it. Now everyone wants a bigger number. Yep. And you, yeah, sure. You can argue some places they took that in a different direction and now it's, you know, trophy hunting and maybe not the best best you know intentions but it still is a great system but there are so many people that like are with you and i like let's do volumetric let's do mass let's do weight i bet if you just got a couple of people with a strong enough voice yes to like start selling shirts with the new name like come up with a really creative new name like boone and crockett hope and young they're great catchy names you got to come out with a good one, you know, something different. Yep. You make shirts about it. You just do stuff. You have like fun with it. You almost take on like cryptocurrency level, like culture and like, you know, sure. jokes and stuff like that. I bet, I bet you'd get so many people on board with this and you just, you do it in a way where it's like, it doesn't have to make or break. Like we did it. So like, um, yeah. we don't have to pay money. It's not costing us anything. We're not going to like go belly up if it doesn't work in three years. Sure. Like we're just going to do this until it catches on and eventually it's going to catch on. That's what we'd like to do. In fact, when, when we get this done, I'll, I'll tag you in it or send it to you. We're going to, we want to do those three bucks, measure them out. Here's where their B, B and C scores are, but here's how much kind of volume and just kind of make it fun. Right? Like, Hey, pick which one you think's the biggest, you know, based off of just looking right. at them and then let's show you what it really is. Have it be fun. But, um, because I'm, in, I'm interested in doing it. Yeah, we you got We got to come up with a good name though, like Booner. Because Bo yeah. I don't know. Maybe they don't even trademark Booner. Maybe we could still call them Booners. They may. My brother's name is Boone, so yeah, you know, it's always a little weird to me. But the, the Pope and Young, like no yeah. one calls him Popers. Like <laughs> oh, even archery hunters still don't. go, he's he's gross Boone. Yeah. So yeah. we got to come up with a good, like a good old boy that was like a phenomenal hunter. Like I always think about like Teddy Roosevelt. Sure. Yeah. Like something like that. Like like the i don't know yeah the the, the jack o'connor or something or like lewis and clark or something like that yeah, yeah. something but it's got to be a catchy name for someone to describe like oh i shot a booner like oh like you can't say like oh i shot a roosevelt sure I don't know. Like, it doesn't work. <laughs> we'll have to ponder on that one we'll have to ponder on it lots of beer lots of pizza lots of campfires <laughs> but we'll get it <laughs> figure it out figure it out there you go. Awesome. Well, it's been just over an hour, Rusty. I really appreciate talking to you, hearing some of the stories, man. It's crazy. Um, Canadian whitetails and shooting big elk and all that stuff. I could go on forever, but I got a little bit of work to wrap up tonight. Understand. Understand. So, well, thank you for being here. Give folks a chance to uh, follow along with you where they can check out all these crazy animals that we've been talking about and all these experiences that you've gone on. Where can they tag along and see the adventures? Yeah, most, most of what I put out there is on Instagram. Uh, my handle on Instagram is a little weird. It's RTS underscore Proverbs 21V19. And so there, you understand behind that. It's a kind of a joke with my wife and I. Proverbs 2119 in the Bible says it's better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. And so, oh. 
every every fall I can joke around and be like, man, honey, you're you're a little ornery. I guess I'm going to go hunting. Um, and it's kind of been a joke with us our whole marriage, and uh, so that's what that stands for. But yeah, RTS underscore Proverbs twenty one B nineteen on Instagram is is where I put up almost. Everything. I had no, I've never read that passage, so I didn't know that that was advice in the Bible. Oh yeah, great great advice from Proverbs. I was told by a pastor that it's better to be in the woods thinking about God than be in church thinking about the woods. <laughs> there you go. So that's why I took it to heart. But I did, I guess I got another backup option too, depending on what the yeah. situation is. Yeah. I have several arrows in that quiver. There you go. Awesome. Well, thanks for being here, Rusty. And thank you for listening, folks.